Hello, dogs and cats and birds and rats, and welcome to Heroic Beasts. I am your host, Brink Bunny. Thank you for joining me here for episode three of this little podcast dedicated to the appreciation of anthropomorphics and zoomorphics in comic books. Uh, for those who might not know the terms like anthropomorphics and zoomorphics, uh, the TLDR is basically talking animals and animal people. Uh, that's the content that we cover uh, here. Uh, this can be anything from like a normal animal serving as a story's protagonist to an animal that stands in its hind legs and acts like a human to some sort of mutant animal-human hybrid. Humans turn into animals, wear creatures, even occasionally humans who just dress up as animals, potentially. It's all fair game for heroic beasts because we love them all equally. I'm interested in spotlighting the great characters, stories, writers, artists, etc., who have contributed to this sort of subgenre, sort of a trope uh, that also kind of spans genres in comic books. Comedy, drama, horror, superheroes, sci-fi, from the mainstream to the obscure, and all ages to mature readers. No matter what kind of books you're looking at, go through a pile of them, you're eventually going to hit some kind of animal person before long. Uh, they're just a staple of the medium and clearly just something we as humans in general respond to. So today, we're going to be talking, of course, about the man, the myth, the legend, Rocket Raccoon, and his first big steps into the mainstream, and the first issue of his 1985 miniseries. Uh, for this special occasion, uh, you know, third episode, it's very special, uh, I'm trying something new. I have with me a very special guest. It is my pleasure to introduce Bandit Gear. Uh, Hello. Uh, hi, Bandit. Um, so Bandit, uh, uh, is who, uh, made our theme song, the, the Heroic Beast theme song. He composed that for me and, uh, let me use it. It was very nice of him. Thank you. I love it. It's awesome. I'm glad you like it. I do. Uh, why don't you let us know a little bit about yourself and what your history is with, uh, comics and furry comics in, in particular? Well, my name is Bandit Care, as you mentioned. I am a part-time musician and composer, but I have also been in the fandom or the furry fandom for a long time now, actually. I think I started in sixth grade, which was, uh, God, I can't even do the math, like mid-90s. Um, I used to always be into anthropomorphics, um, particularly, especially as a kid. There was plenty of cartoons to get kind of get into that had anthropomorphic characters. And I kind of realized that I just, just kind of drawn to them. Um, so I was also an avid reader, and so I would also read a lot of books, which led me to kind of find more of the community online, um, and particularly the, a lot of the story archives. So I spent a lot of time reading a lot of furry stories online, as well as um, kind of going into the comics as I got older. Though as a kid, I was a big Sonic the Hedgehog fan, and so I used to actually buy those Sonic comics um, and read those, and to me, those were the highlight of comics um, for a long time. Of course, I did enjoy a lot of the cartoons that were on at the time, such as Batman and Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's things like The Tick. Um, <laughs> there was like a lot of good media going on in the 90s. <laughs> My number one was probably X-Men. So, I mean, I can still that the music, like the theme song and all of that, like the X-Men animated series, that was, whew, that was, that was a great series. I don't know. I was, I'm like 10 plus years older than you. I don't remember it with quite the reference, I think, that you do at, at your age at the time. But I did enjoy it, and I watched probably every episode of the show. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I tried watching it on Disney Plus recently, and the animation isn't quite as good as I remember it. <laughs> no. But <laughs> back in my kid mind, oh, my gosh. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it always goes. Do you remember your uh, your first comic, your very first comic, or your first anthro comic, or at least maybe the first comic that made the biggest impression of you, the one that you have the biggest memory of? The first comic that I can think of that really, like, I was super into, um, actually, online comics was a big part of my life um, for several years. Um, There's a lot of great comic artists that were just posting strips daily, and one that kind of sticks out to me is one called Ozzy and Millie. It was this really cute cartoon with uh, this like fox kid and this I think he was like a wolf or something um, but they just kind of get in like adventures it's very Calvin and Hobbes-esque right. I would say um, but I used to oh man I love that comic and I think I have a hard copy somewhere of it I'm not sure cool I don't think I know that one 
Uh, what about Rocket Raccoon? We're covering a Rocket Raccoon comic. So what is your uh, what was your first experience with that character? Was it in comics or was it not till the movies? I'm pretty sure it wasn't till the movies, which is kind of embarrassing considering I how much I love him now. But yeah, I think it was the first movie that I was really introduced to him. Uh, I certainly had heard the name, but I wasn't really familiar with the character himself until the movies. Yeah, I think a, a lot of people got introduced to him at, with the movies because he was very obscure up until uh, 2007 when they brought him into the Guardians of the Galaxy comic, which was really only out for about 30, 40 issues, I want to say, before the movie came out. Is Rocket your favorite comic character? Or do you have a different favorite comic character? I would definitely say that he is up there. Um, I would say definitely in the top three. Recently, I've been really into Spider Gwen since the watching the Into the Spider Verse. Um, so I've been kind of trying to make my way through all of her comics, and I also because X Men again is one of my first love uh, loves. So I mm -hmm. really always go back to X Men comics and X Men characters. Um, right now, my favorite X Men is or is it X Man. I'm always not sure to say if you say a favorite X Man or X Men, but uh, Glob Herman is up there because he's awkward and romantic, and I identify with both of those things. Okay. Is he that guy who's like, he looks like he's made a jello and you see like his parts floating around yes. inside? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Despite he's that, he's very sweet and I <laughs> love him. Cool. Uh, do you have a current favorite series or, or what are you what are you reading these days? I know that you're you're into like manga, right? Am I saying that right? I'm very Canadian. That is true. And it, well, yes, it is manga. <laughs> okay. Um, if you want to be correct. But yeah, I have been reading Beastars, I admit, um, and that's almost finished. I've only been reading the official English translations, right. um, but I wish I had more time to do more reading. Um, again, like Spider-Gwen's been on my radar to kind of catch up, and I've actually been trying to read through all the Rocket Raccoon issues. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's just I uh, wish I had, wish my life was less busy and then I would be able to do more reading, but it seems like between teaching and work and things like that, I just haven't had as much time as I'd like. Yeah, I know what you mean. I got stacks of comics that I would love to read, and I keep buying new ones, and they just go on the stack. I also, I also try to keep up with some of the furry stories that are still being written because I know the the fandom is very art oriented, but I still mm -hmm. like to read what some of the authors are putting out. So I'll catch up with some uh, some Kyle Gold, uh, whatever novels he's putting out, mm -hmm. or I will check. Uh, I have follow a couple of Patreons and some writers too. Um, still try to support those, that side of the fandom as well. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, um, I'm very happy to have you here as the first guest on the podcast. Thank you for yeah. agreeing to be on. Uh, before we dive into, uh, Rocket getting his first close up, Mr. DeMille, let's see what's on the bunny by pile this time. Uh, so this is, uh, might be a bit of a coming soon, but it'll be coming very soon if it isn't already out by the time I put out this episode. It's something that's probably going to be of special interest to furries in particular. It's called Plush. This is a new series from Image Comics uh, from writer Doug Wagner and artist Daniel Hilliard. This is the third Image series from Wagner and Hilliard in what they refer to as their Material Trilogy. The first series in the trilogy was Plastic. It was about a retired serial killer trying to retrieve a plastic sex doll, which happens to be his girlfriend, from the mob. Uh, their second series, Vinyl, featured an Alzheimer's suffering killer in a teddy bear mask who can only kill when he's listening to records. See, Vinyl. Uh, uh, trying to save his friend from a cult. Uh, the series are... Full of absurd dark humor, tons of gore. This is definitely adult content. Uh, and the series don't connect in terms of story, by the way, just in tone. Uh, and the, the element that kind of ties it together in the, in the uh, uh, trilogy is the fact that they're all about a specific material, thus the material tril trilogy. And the third and final in the trilogy, or at least so far, they might do another one, who knows, it'll be a quadrology, uh, is called Plush. And here's the gist of Plush. An average guy, Devin, is convinced to attend his first furry convention by a furry friend. While at the con, he gets separated from his friend, uh, and Devin stumbles upon a group of three furries who have killed another convention attendee and are eating him. And now that Devin has seen them, they set their sights on him. 
I am personally extremely excited for this series. I have not read Plastic or Vinyl, but everything I've read about them, uh, they were extremely well-reviewed. When asked about his research for a comic involving furries, Doug Wagner said, Luckily for me, I have quite a few friends in the furry community, so it was easy for me to get on the phone and chat them up. Plus, I have my own fascination with the culture. I've even been to a few furry conventions myself. Meanwhile, artist Daniel Hilliard has clearly done his homework, as we see many furries, aside from our three cannibals populating the convention in the preview pages that you can find online. And the fursuits depicted are unique and colorful, non-generic. Uh, they look like real costumes, real fursuits. He's got the details right. Uh, the series is also launching with a number of alternate covers for issue one, including one by uh, My Little Pony artist and writer of the hit series Stray Dogs, Tony Fleeks. Uh, so there's all kinds of furry connection here and content. Uh, if a story about cannibal furries sounds like your cup of tea, plush issue one hits the stands on November 30th. And you can get that at pretty much any, it's an image comic, you can get it at pretty much any comic store you can go into, and you can sure you can order copies online, and probably get it digitally as well. And there's all kinds of ways to buy it, so there you go. And that's uh, that's uh, the Bunny Buy Pile for this episode. Wow. As someone who may or may not be going to a furry convention soon, I'm hoping no one's going to, going to be doing any kind of uh, research <laughs> or... Uh reenacting any of those uh <laughs> comics at the convention you don't want to do that i was gonna ask you if you wanted to kill someone and eat them later like uh, at the I convention I, at mff i think i'm good there's some yeah. there's some good restaurants in chicago that you know my, my, i'll get a deep dish and then you can have like you know a human body or something and you know <laughs> we'll just share a beer all right sounds good so with that out of the way bunny by pile out of the way uh, let's get down to brass tacks, continuing our look at the early stories of arguably the most popular anthro character in comics these days, Rocket Raccoon. In episode one, we looked at Marvel preview number seven. In episode two, we covered the Incredible Hulk number 271, Rocket's first two appearances. At the time, following these early stories, one would not describe Rocket as popular by any stretch of the imagination. He was novelty at best. Uh, a one-off background character at worst. The only page real estate he'd ever really taken up was in, er, in 1976 uh, as a glorified comic relief in Marvel Preview. And then he was part of the gag funny animal story based around Beatles puns in the Incredible Hulk issue in 1982. He was essentially unknown. And for three years, he hadn't been in anything at all. Just dropped off the map after those two issues. Wow. Yeah, and in 1985, Rocket suddenly leaps out as the lead character in his own series. So how the hell did that happen? How did this obscure funny animal rate his own series for Marvel Comics? For a little context, Marvel, a lot of comics companies actually, uh, Marvel in particular has is well known over the years uh, for chasing the trends. Uh, all the way back to the creating their first team book, The Fantastic Four, in response to DC's success with Justice League of America. Uh, and not just comic trends, uh, pop culture trends as well, like Grindhouse, Chop Saki, and exploitation films, and stunt riders like Evil Knievel, and disco music. Marvel's reaction to that stuff is where we got Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu, Luke Cage, Power Man, Ghost Rider, Dazzler, uh, in the early 60s, surfing culture emerged and started gaining popularity, and guess who showed up in 1965? Uh, I'll give you a hint. He's silver. Uh, and, he, and he surfs. Can I answer Stay the there. question? Yes, you may. Is it Silver Surfer? Correct. It was Silver Surfer. It was a tricky <laughs> one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had to study for that one. Yeah. Uh, so what was the trend I'm alluding to? that almost certainly helped open the door for Rocket Raccoon in 1985 that Marvel would want to get on board. So let's travel back in time one year to 1984 and the release of the first issue of a little comic you may have heard of called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Ooh. I don't want to go too deep into the history of TMNT because I think I'll probably, hopefully, be digging into them in a future episode uh, or two. But suffice to say... Uh, 
saying TMNT was a big indie comics hit is a huge understatement. The, their success for a small press black and white comic was unprecedented. Like nothing had ever been seen before. I should have mm-hmm. mentioned that, yeah, TM, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was huge for me, especially. I remember I had one birthday party that my friends still don't forgive me for, which I made everyone watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, <laughs> Turtles Back in Time, <laughs> which at the time I thought was one of the best movies ever made. <laughs> wow. And they didn't, your friends didn't like it? <laughs> I, I still get a lot of crap for that, but I mean, there were turtles in Japan, like... Come on, like, how could it get any better than that? Oh, Philistines. How could they not enjoy? <laughs> and they even got to, didn't they get to, what's his name? Cotius back as Casey Jones? I believe so. I did, yeah. That's another one that I have to rewatch and reminisce about how amazing it is. But it was like the third April O'Neil, right? They had like a new April O'Neil for every movie, I think. I was, as a kid, I would not have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Like I, I didn't, never even noticed on like that. What was that? Uh, Fresh Prince when they when the mother swapped out. I did you not know didn't that. You didn't notice Aunt Viv changing? Are you I kidding mean, me? Now, <laughs> now it's obvious. But <laughs> as a kid, no, maybe she's a little tanner or something. Just like a foot and a half shorter. <laughs> I mean, okay, now I see it. <laughs> oh, man. Original Aunt Viv was awesome. I mean, the new one was fine, too, but original Aunt Viv was awesome. Yeah, she was. <laughs> um, anyway, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 so, uh, but basically, I was saying, that's right, the, the, the success of TMNT was unprecedented. Uh, it really surprised everybody in the industry, and it created this boom in independent black and white comics and this uh, speculator bubble, people that wanted to buy the next big Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle hit, style hit. Uh, so all these new indie comics publishers, like, uh, uh, you know, companies popped up and were just throwing out content and comic shops were buying it all up and people were buying them off the shelves to, with the idea that they will one day make money uh, off of selling them like they would with Ninja Turtles, but d- didn't happen. Didn't work out oh. for them. It was. It's called the the black and white boom and bust. Uh, it happened in the. I want to say it was like yeah, eighty four through eighty eight, eighty nine, something like that. I didn't do all my research on this one, but in that uh, uh, sort of small press black and white boom, publishers were looking to cash in on kind of like the easy like. How do we replicate Ninja Turtles? How do we make another book like Ninja Turtles? A lot of books came out that were parodies, but a lot of books also came out just trying to like take certain elements that were the same. And one of the main elements of Ninja Turtles is anthropomorphic animals. So a lot of these black and white can- comic books coming out were, you know, action slash satire type comics. I was I was actually thinking about the fact that um, I think it was around the same time where a lot of furry zines were happening. So like things like Albedo um, and Yurf and things like that. Um, where actually Usagi Yojimbo actually came out of that, which that was a like a short, like just a comic that was in one of those zines. And then obviously that became pretty popular and now it even exists within the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles world, which I think is pretty cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Albedo and what was the other early one? Was it Furlough? Did that come oh, a yeah, later? Oh, yeah, I remember Furlough. I had some of those, too. Anthropomorphic animals, as a result, from all this uh, uh, aping Ninja Turtles and doing these satire comics, uh, became a big deal. So Marvel, presumably, now there's no, nobody at Marvel has ever made this statement, but it's the timing is kind of hard to ignore, that Rocket Raccoon pops up in 1985. Rocket Raccoon is fairly unknown, but I guess they, you know, Mantlo had some clout and uh, pitched the series and they were like, yeah, let's do it. This is the time for it. So that's how Rocket Raccoon needs to tip his hat to uh, the Ninja Turtles as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Turtles. Turtle power. Moving along to the comic itself. Let's get into Rocket Raccoon number one. Uh, Cover price, 75 cents. And uh, this issue had a release date of February 1985. Um, now the cover has the, the cover date of May 1985. That 
the date on the cover is always three months after the comic was actually released, because that is the date that the newsstand is supposed to know to take it off the racks and send it back to the distributor to get their money back, because the comic's not supposed to be distributed anymore, in case Wait, anyone really? was wondering. Yes. Is that still the case? Yes. Oh, wow. Well, at least it's still done that way. I don't know how, I don't know if that process is the same anymore, but back all the way back to the 40s, I would wow. say. Uh, yeah, I learned. There you go. That's it. That's, this is an educational podcast. <laughs> okay, but yeah, February 1985 is the date this comic was released. Uh, so we've got a pop quiz for Bandit. All right, I'm ready. Okay. February 1985, what was the number one movie in theaters when this comic was released? If you know it, shout it out. If you don't, I can give you a hint. Off the top of my head, my guess is going to be Back to the Future. Oh, that's a solid guess. But that's, it's wrong? It's wrong. Oh. Okay, I'll give you a hint. So I know that's Axel F. That was in... <laughs> Hold on. Look, I was born a year after this. <laughs> This is exactly a year before I before I was born. Okay, I'll um, give you another hint. It, it is Axel F. Axel F is the name of the central character in the movie. That's why it's called Axel F. Really, there's a movie with Axel F in it. Well, his <laughs> last name starts with F. Was it a comedy? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is Action comedy. This is embarrassing. Um, was it like a teenage comedy? No. Bam. Too late. Oh. Okay. It expired. Uh, it was Beverly Hills Cop. Oh, okay. All right. I think Eddie, I should have seen that. Eddie Murphy plays Axel Foley in Beverly Hills Cop. I do know Axel F. I've actually played Axel F before, like performed it. So. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Well, now you know. It's Axel Foley. It's Eddie Murphy. You just picture Eddie Murphy dancing. To Dang, the, I he never done danced a more in authentic the movie, performance. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's do. Uh, let's get into the creative team of the issue. Rock Raccoon number one. Uh, writer again, Bill Mantlo. Bill Mantlo, of course, the creator of Rocket Raccoon. I guess keeps trying to push him back out to to get him into the Marvel universe. And luckily for us, he was doing that. He gave a shit about the character and really wanted to get him in. And I'm going to assume pitched this and uh, got it made. So thank you, Bill. Uh, pencils, Mike Mignola. Of course, very famous these days. He started in. 1983, as an inker uh, for Marvel on Daredevil and Power Man and Iron Fist. The Rocket Raccoon miniseries was his first penciling work. Uh, and he, he, he parlayed that into working on the Hulk and Alpha Flight as well. He moved over to DC for a while, worked on the Phantom Stranger, the World of Krypton series. And uh, probably his biggest thing that he did for most well-known thing he did at DC was the covers for the Batman story, A Death in the Family. Uh, where they killed off the second Robin, Jason Todd. They did lots more cover work over the years for DC and Marvel, uh, but then along came 1994, and he finally got his own uh, uh, creation into the world, Hellboy. So after that happened, his legacy was pretty much secure. His Hellboy is a much beloved uh, comic series, and th been three movies and a couple cartoons, and yeah, so yeah, I love the movies. So you've never read any of the Hellboy comics? I don't think I have. I, mean, I have seen the movies. Yeah. Wasn't that Ron I, Perlman, right? The first two were Ron Perlman, and then the third one, the more recent one, was uh, David Harbour, I think. Uh, moving on, inks were done by Al Gordon. Colors by Christy Scheel. Letters, Ken Bruzenak. Uh The editor was Carl Potts, and the editor-in-chief was Jim Shooter. All right, let's, uh, let's get into the action. So we're here. We see the cover of uh, of issue one. We see Mignola's redesign of Rocket featured on the cover, and his little green togs, his uh, double wielding pistols, and shooting clowns. And uh, uh, you, you can see that Rocket's style. He's become more anthropomorphized with sort of more human. Uh, chest and shoulders and stuff like that and arms 
of the in the other versions he was a little bit more raccoon like uh and uh, Mignola kind of expanded on him a bit here i'm very curious what people would think when they first saw this comic back in you know 1985 like here's this clown killing raccoon and then a bunny with to me that looks very lightsaber ish like behind him like Mm -hmm. i mean i would have been very intrigued um, especially if you hate clowns, I think this would really speak to you. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. It's a creepy clown head that he's shooting off to. So this is early Mignola, but uh, you can still see his uh, trademark style emerging. Personally, my favorite part of the cover is the chimp with the sword. I think that's the strongest image. I think that's the the coolest part, like just that little thing. It's a great silhouette. And I love his face with the the samurai shogun helmet. I'm surprised nothing's showing under that whatever he's wearing, but, you know. Comics code. It's approved by the comics code. No monkey penises allowed. (laughs) Let's move on into page one. So we got uh, some uh, text here. You're about to enter a strange and not always rational galaxy, a sector of space called the Keystone Quadrant. So welcome back to the Keystone Quadrant. We see uh, uh, Space Wheel, a division of Divinities. Inc. Little sign there. Uh, Space Wheel has returned from the Hulk issue. Uh, But it looks like it's gotten a makeover. A little more wheel-like with a central kind of globe area. Some more obvious looking Flash Gordon weapons. And uh, see a few ships flying about. Implying that there's more space travel in the Keystone Quadrant now than there was in the Hulk issue. Which seemed to just be Rocket Raccoon. Uh, We enter the story on a panel that uh, takes up most of the page. Uh, we got the chief toy smith of Space Wheel, an anthropomorphic iguana in a lab coat surrounded by toys he's made. Uh, finishing up his last toy for the day there. Uh, uh, he seems like he's in a pretty good mood. We see behind him in the doorway a very Mignola-esque silhouette of what is pretty obviously a clown with a gun. Uh, uh, of course, we read Incredible Hulk 271, so we remember that the killer clowns were robots that fought the Hulk and Rocket out in space. Yeah, and uh, there's our title, Animal Crackers. I actually really like this iguana guy, which is, does not bode well for him because my history with guys that I, or any characters that I like in anime or comics is uh, not very good. Your uh, instincts are correct. It's not going to go well for this iguana. It's the, as, as we will see as we move on to page two, uh, the Toy Smith is giving us a little bit more exposition here. Uh, he was behind schedule, but he's all caught up. And as the Toy Smith is putting the finishing touch on his Punch and Judy looking doll, uh, he sees reflected behind him one of the clowns sneaking up on him. Uh, and he says, uh, one of Judson Jake's clowns here aboard Space Wheel? Which lets us know something has changed since uh, 271. Uh, whether it be a retcon Mantlo made for story reasons or some event that transpired in the last three years, Judson Jake's the mole is no longer in charge of Space Wheel and the Hulk Justin Jakes lived on Space Wheel. It was his. Now it's apparently he's breaking into it. Uh, and uh, some dialogue from the Toy Smith as well as a sign on the Space Wheel implies that uh, someone named Lord Divine is now in charge of Space Wheel. Before the Toy Smith can really react, uh, the clown pretty much blows him away. Toy Smith hits the wall. Sound effects that go snap, crackle, and then plop as he hits the floor. So we're, we're getting the puns in early. But we get a clear look of Mignola's uh, clown robot. Uh, Sal Buscemas looked very much like mob thugs in clown makeup. Uh, Mignola went a different direction, and uh, the clown is much more exaggerated and creepy. A bit more killer clowns or, you know, a more recent iteration of Pennywise-style clown. A lot creepier. Something that I really love about this page is just, like, the different camera angles that this page goes through like every single panel is like the camera has shifted by a lot but you don't lose the action at all like you don't doesn't like confuse you Mm -hmm. even like this last panel here where it's like from this dying toy maker's point of view looking up at this clown like i think it's just i think it's pretty cool like how how it shifts through all these different positions yeah artists that know what they're doing can really get a lot out of panel layouts on a page and and Mignola is still early here, but uh, clearly he knows what he's doing already. Page three. 
the alarm has sounded, and the clown is uh, trying to make his escape, but he's got to get through Space Wheel's Defense Force, a squadron of chimpanzee samurais. Uh, they sound the alarm with the call of Chim Chim Cheri. <laughs> <laughs> is that a Mary Poppins reference? <laughs> I, I'm going to assume. But they don't appear to be giving the clown that much trouble, These uh, the samurai chimps. Uh, he's waltzing through them. He's shooting them down with his blaster and shooting lasers from his finger also. Which makes you wonder why he needs a blaster. But yeah, some good, uh, some fun scenes here. The clown just disassembling the monkeys. On to page four. Uh, for the first time here, we see Lord Deva- Divine. Uh, looks to be some kind of lizard ordering Black Jack O'Hare and the Black Bunny Brigade into action. We know the Black Bunnies are mercenaries, so it looks like they're no longer in Jake's employ, as they were in Hulk 271. Now they're working for Lord Divine. Bunnies, apparently much more efficient than chimps. They take down the clown right away. Why do you even have the samurai chimps? Yeah, that kind of begs the question. Why, why never send a monkey to do a bunny's job, is the, this is the lesson here. Uh, Lord Divine quickly assesses the situation, uh, saying only one man would stand to benefit from his toy smith being murdered, murdered his competitor Judson Jakes. He's going to sick the law on Judson Jakes, so he's going to call in to page five. We get our title slate, Rocket Raccoon. And here we go, our first look at Rocket and his pal Walrus and his girlfriend Lila, uh, as rendered by rendered rather by the mighty Mike Mignola. Uh, so here's Rocket, still a smoker, evidently. He's got his pipe, lounging, his little by this uh, little lake or stream or whatever this is. Walrus is in the water, uh, while Lila is up on top of the waterfall, giving us a little striptease. Yeah, I mean, we got this behind-the-back view, followed by completely naked... Uh, I think you mentioned this before, but she, does she look like an otter, more like an otter now? Or, like, is she, she a sable? Like, <laughs> Oh, I think she looks much more like an otter than she did in the Hulk. Yeah, okay. The Hulk, she looked like a fucking mangled weasel. So now we got a beautiful, sleek, naked otter. Yep. Nude otter. Ooh la la. Parents cover the kids' eyes. <laughs> um, notable change. Uh, Rocket, as he lounges, says he is trying to translate the Half-World Bible. So it's no longer Gideon's Bible, as it was known in the Incredible Hulk 271, uh, which was named in reference to the Beatles' Rocky Raccoon song. Maybe this is a sign that Mantlo figured uh, he could explore Rocket in his world. He wanted to step away from this sort of story just being a bunch of pop culture references and, and puns and stuff like that. So he's trying to establish it a little bit more uh, uniquely and, and, and leave the pun, some of the pun stuff behind that was a particular reach, like Gideon's Bible. I can appreciate that. I mean, I really enjoy puns, obviously, but I can appreciate trying to build your own world and change names around and things like that. Yeah. You want your you want your stuff to be to stand on its own, especially once you get uh, a mini series going. Page six, Lila dives into the little lake here and splashes Rocket, uh, drawing him into the lake so they can frolic. Lila asks Walrus, her uncle, if he'd like to join them in frolicking, which is weird, right? Like that's kind of weird thing to ask your uncle. I mean, come it depends play on how with... you define frolicking, I guess. I mean, hey. she is naked still, so. Hey, Unc, I'm going to get naked and frolic. You want to join? <laughs> it's all right. Lila's just kind of freaky. That's cool. Good for her. <laughs> Walrus gets out of the water and says he's going to soak up some sun when those rascals, the Keystone Cops, show up in their early 1900s style motor car. When Walrus announces the arrival of the Keystone Cops, we get another notable change from the status quo of Hulk 271. Wall refers to them as Rocket's deputies. On to page seven, the cops have crashed their car into the lake, and uh, they all salute Ranger Rocket and deliver the news to him. They got a call at the Cuckoo's Nest that Lord Divine's chief toysmith has been assassinated. Uh, so Rocket suits up and prepares to head to the Cuckoo's Nest. I actually love this panel where they're all saluting, and the guy like crashed through the front window of the car and is still saluting while you know bent over the hood of the this car <laughs> like <laughs> that is yeah. some dedication yeah and they're, they're, they take their keystone cap in serious 
Good for them. Uh, Rocket is mad at first when uh, the Keystone cops arrive, uh, disturbing his day off, and asks them why they abandoned the mission he assigned them, tracking the Snail Gang. We find out Rocket gave the cops their uniforms so they could play police uh, and assign them this mission of tracking snails to keep them out of his hair. So yeah, these just, they're crazy idiots that he just needs to get to go away. We also get a glimpse of the cuckoo's nest here, and now instead of being populated by animals as it was in the Hulk, it seems to be full of what Rocket calls loonies. People who appear to be adult humans dressed in costumes playing with toys. Honestly, I could see this being my ideal retirement home. Like, you know, you hang out, you play with uh, trains and dress up as, I don't know, I who's the first person who pops into my head, uh, Bill Nye or something. Like, I could... I could <laughs> I could see that being in my future. Sure. Something something like that's in all our futures, really. Like, eventually, that's, that's where we're going to end up. I don't know if we get to dress up like Bill Nye or Napoleon, but... As long as I can take enough medication that I see a talking raccoon who orders me around. <laughs> <laughs> right, so yeah, yeah, this is the, the introduction of the loonies, which uh, play a big part in this uh, this issue in this series. On to page eight. This is a weird page. Rocket is dropping by the ancient chapel known as the Admissions Ward and delivers the half-world Bible back to its apparent caretaker, the leader of the Good Humor Men, who Rocket refers to by the honorific Your Mindlessness. Uh, his mindlessness refers to the writers of the Bible as the Shrinks, the ancient gods who created us all. And as the good humor men begin their sacred ritual, dancing around in straight jackets, Rocket takes off. Do you think this is a commentary on religion, or is this just, you know, you know, building this world where it's just, like, kooky? I think, I definitely think it's probably a commentary on religion. Bill Mantlo was very, um, he was a, he was definitely a hippie, a very progressive-minded a uh, fellow back in his day. Gotcha. It does seem, it seems very likely that this is all a commentary. Um, but th at the same time, the, the loonies are played as uh, good and well-meaning. Like they're not, they're, the loonies are definitely not the bad guys, at least not in this issue. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're harmless and uh, they just, they just do their thing. They have their, their little rituals that they like to go through. We get the sense uh, in this page that Rocket is an important person in the community, somewhere between a warden and a sheriff. Uh, he's uh, well-liked and trusted by the loonies. And uh, from this page and everything that's going on in here, we get an inkling of the background, the backstory of Halfworld here. Uh, probably could deduce this planet was once some sort of asylum run by the Shrinks, who for whatever reason disappeared. After they did, Rocket and these evolved animals, possibly former pets or playmates for the loonies, have taken over running the planet. Uh, we're moving on to page nine. Rocket joins Lila and Wall in the communications room to talk to Lord Divine, uh, who accuses Juz and Jakes of being the one responsible for murdering his toy smith. And his proof holds up the head of the killer clown, adding that only Juz and Jakes would profit from driving him out of business. And uh, then at the end of the page, page here, uh, Lord Divine also creepily hits on Lila, just to make sure we don't think he's someone we should be rooting for. Yeah, they always pull the hit on the nice, innocent damsel in distress to uh, mm -hmm. kind of make someone evil. Did they yep. ever mention why he has a toy maker? Like, is that standard or why there are toy makers? Yeah. Well, it, it's it does get into it here uh, uh, that the. The loonies are basically the basically they are the animals' reason for being. They need to That's entertain right. the, the 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 loonies, and loonies need toys to play with. So there's this competition between these two toy makers to be the ones to provide the toys for the loonies, and that's why Jake's and Lord Divine are these two sort of megalomaniacal toy distributors uh, at odds with each other. Okay, I, I kind of want to see more of that like interaction. I want to see the, <laughs> the the toy maker versus toy maker comic arc. The reality show happened in like <laughs> in the in the in the toy 
uh, uh, factories. Yeah, that that's that that has legs. I think they should. I think <laughs> Marvel should revisit this. Yeah, you pitch it. No, yeah, I, I might. I might. I'll write a stern letter. Letter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so along to page 10, uh, Rocket tells Lord Divine he better stay away from his gal and says he doesn't, uh, doesn't like Jake's or Divine. Toy moguls who have bus- whose business practices are driving him crazy uh, as he tries to keep the peace on Half-World. Divine says, too bad without the toys. Uh, you know, the loonies would sink into a fatal melancholia. Uh, Rocket knows he's right. So he and Wall take off in the rack and ruin to go see Judds and Jakes and uh, start to investigate what's been going on. Another pretty good page. I think Rocket looks a little goofy on the last panel there. His eyes are kind of weirdly set. Yeah, I uh, just noticed that. That is that is that is an interesting face. Yeah. I mean, his eyes like often kind of look like very beady i would say but <laughs> yeah here they just look uneven and beady at the same time yeah it's a bit more of a rush uh, job on that panel rocket's also just like like he's fu- look at his chest he's just fucking that's a arnold schwarzenegger chest look at how wide his shoulders are it's hey you no know, fucking hitting the gym if you were wondering what lila sees in him there it is <laughs> <laughs> on to page 11 uh, as the Rack and Ruin soars off, we get a rundown of life on Half World. Uh, a little retconned update of what we learned in The Incredible Hulk. The evolved animals, rather than just living in peace, provide protection and companionship for the loonies. I just, just sort of said this earlier, but we'll just go over it again. Uh, the robot story is unchanged. On the other half of the world, they make machines for the animals uh, and are building their humanoid spaceship for whatever reason. Rocket ponders the meaning of it all while remembering his encounter with the Hulk. So the Hulk, you know, is, this is the same continuity. We're saying this is the same thing. We've changed a couple of details, but we're just going to glaze over those facts and kind of just sort of squint so that it all runs together well. I mean, obviously, this history doesn't exist in like the MCU, but I haven't read much of the recent Guardians comics, but do they still reference this uh, interaction at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they... Oh. I don't know how word for word like rocket definitely comes from half world uh it's where he became uh you know sentient and bipedal and stuff like that uh in later uh uh, stories about this kind of time period there's it's sort of like more stuff is implied to have been going on behind the scenes uh some more sinister type stuff maybe this is a little bit of a uh, looking through fairy tale glasses at Rocket's past kind of uh, uh, approach is the way this is looked at in the future. But it is it is uh, all still canon. Lila has showed up again. Black Jack O'Hare shows up again. Uh, so yeah, this is all this is all his uh, his real history. Gotcha. Yeah, that's, uh, I haven't seen much of like Rocket and hulk other than when i read the uh first the uh, issue before this the hulk 27 that's like the only 271 yeah um the letters are small at this um <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i haven't seen much interaction beyond that of the two characters and it'd be interesting to see more yeah back to this page i really love that robot that mignola drew the one that's beside the beaver oh yeah uh, i think that's a real cool robot just wanted to mention that. He's cute. Reminds me of Fooly Cooly. Oh, yeah? I don't Another know. anime, yeah. I know of Fooly Cooly, but I haven't watched it. In the next page, we get a establishing shot here. Uh, the Rack and Ruin approaches Judson Jake's HQ, Mayhem Mechanics. Uh, newly renamed. Formerly, he was uh, Judson Jake's company was Interstellar Mechanics. Now, Mayhem Mechanics. And since Lord Divine is now on Space Wheel, Jake's looks like he's located in a border area between the half robot or, or between the robot half of the uh, of the world and the animal side of the world. And the ship de- descends into this sort of mole hole so they can go talk to Jake's. This is a pretty cool establishing shot. I love the little rat guard guy. And uh, all of it is very, very Mignola, very striking sort of composition it's a cool little 
poster image there almost. Yeah, I love all these parts that the rat guy is standing on. Like, there's a lot of details in there that, you know, weren't probably necessary for this shot, but, Mm -hmm. you know, they're there and it's pretty interesting. Yeah. I feel like by nature of having these clowns makes him the more evil of them. Like, (laughs) (laughs) the, the giant clown head on the on the base is like i don't know that's it's kind of evil yep yep you associate your satan yourself with clowns you're 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 just evil it's just the way it is it is i'm sorry to all the clown listeners out there (laughs) (laughs) somebody loves you (laughs) we're kidding yeah (laughs) i'm sure sure some of you are perfectly acceptable people (laughs) Uh, moving moving on to page 13 uh, cut up to Space Wheel, where Lord Divine is watching the Rack and Ruin descending into Judson Jake's place, uh, and uh, he reveals his goal. While Rocket is distracted, he's going to have Blackjack O'Hare kidnap Lila for him, uh, partly because she is the heir to uh, Jake's toy empire, somehow, but also because he's a creep. This other reason to want Lila, he's just a creepy, creepy guy who is perving on Lila. Meanwhile, back on Half World, we see Lila and his mindlessness preparing for the Great Masquerade, where every loony can be whoever he or she thinks they truly are. But sneaking through the proceedings in a robe to disguise himself as a familiar face from Hulk 271, Uncle Pico. This page is actually notable because I think this is the first and possibly only time in comics that we see Blackjack O'Hare without his mask. Very top oh. panel on the left, uh, he's he's holding his little helmet beside him, and we see a full furry rabbit head. So it's not it's not cybernetics. We know it's a helmet. You know, it's very hard to be intimidated by a bunny, and I think both with the mask and without the mask, he's kind of cute. I'm offended by that. <laughs> Sorry. I'm- I'm this very arch- intimidating. <laughs> y- yes, very. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is over. <laughs> okay, sorry. The very scary <laughs> Black Jack O'Hare. <laughs> he is very intimidating. Look at him. He's mercenary. <laughs> Who leaves by saying, I'll be back with her in two shakes of a <laughs> hare's tail, boss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Animal puns. Well, I guess that one's not quite a pun, but you know what I mean pretty intimidating yeah uh and another also notable on this page i think uncle pico looks more or less the same as he did in the hulk issue with one notable exception he seems to be about half the size or less than he was in that hulk issue uh he was about the size of the hulk like talking to the hulk eye to eye in the hulk issue and now he looks like he's maybe waist high to a human um, as you get older you know some people shrink yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah we see the loonies doing their thing lila's uh getting in there we see a little pig guy in there as well hopefully he was the guy that was shot the pig guy that was shot in the incredible hulk issue and he has recovered i felt really sad about that oh poor guy um moving on page 14 uncle pico is sneaking into the admissions ward we know what he wants he wants to steal the half world bible and he's replacing it with a fake uh, as he sneaks out, Lila notices him, uh, but doesn't recognize him through his disguise. So Lila, maybe not the sharpest. Um, when the good humor men, uh, enter the chamber to consult the half-world Bible, the book pops open and a jack-in-the-box head pops out, disturbing them greatly, because that's not supposed to happen. That's their holy book. Uh, it always feels like such a waste to have a giant room with one important item in the middle of it. Like, it's just a lot of room that's not being used. You don't have room like that in your house? I, I wish I did, but I don't know what I would put in the middle. <laughs> Page 15. Uh, Lila, seeing uh, uh, what's happened, the, the, the jack-in-the-box head coming out of the book, and the loonies freaking out, uh, uh, she figures out who the rogue figure was. She realizes, wait, that was Uncle Pico. Uh, she rushes to grab her weapon to pursue Pico, but before she gets a chance, she's grabbed from behind and pulled away by Blackjack O'Hare, who in the panel five we see hiding in the on the left-hand side of the panel, waiting for Lila to come in. Wow, I didn't notice that. Yeah, look at that. 
Uh, Lila, I think, is like adorable in her little robe with her giant pistol. <laughs> she is. There's a lot, a lot of details I was looking at, like the way the robe just flows and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Compared to compared to Lila from the Hulk issue, it's just, it's night and day. She's so much cooler in this issue. I like how you can see the jewel pop off her head as she's getting grabbed there. Yep. Oh, Blackjack. Why, why do you have to be so mean? Uh, okay, moving on to page 16. Uh, back to Rocket and Wall aboard the Rack and Ruin. Page 16. Passing through uh, Mayhem Mechanic's dumping ground for all the rejected toys. This is uh, lots of lifeless clowns. It's creepy. Um, and boxes and pipes and stuff. As uh, as they approach the main factory, Wall asks Rocket if uh, they should bring up the shields. But Rocket, just as Rocket is saying yes, something catches his eye out the window. This is uh, uh, panel two is sort of a classic pick of Rocket. It became one of like the the more seen images that if you search for like Rocket Raccoon Mignola, then you'll usually see this image. You know, he's just right in the center, spotlighted on his own. With wall in the in the foreground there, it's a pretty cool pick. It is, and, and his eyes like actually look pretty good in this one too. Yeah, yeah. Mignola was trying to do get the get that like you know realistic like animal eye rather than doing like a cartoon eye for them. But uh, I think with the the coloring of them blue like that, it kind of took some of the effect away. And uh, it doesn't always leave you with a really good impression of his eye direction. So uh, it's a it's a mixed bag. Okay, I think yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So smart. It's like, you know, art. I know stuff. I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an expert funny book person. On to the next page. The Rack and Ruin is caught by a giant nutcracker. Uh, inside the ship, we see Rocket and Wall being tossed about. Rocket tells Wall to hang on tight. Well, he puts on his rocket boots and heads outside to free the ship. But on the last panel, we see Rocket reacting in surprise to something ahead of him. What could it be? Uh, there's some really cool rocket panels on this page. Finally donning his rocket boots to go soaring around. Um, I think Mignola is hitting his stride here. Some really cool silhouettes and, and poses and rocket action. I do wish they would bring uh, the rocket boots back, though. I could see that being pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, his rocket boots made for some cool stuff. So we turn the page to page 18. Rocket is facing down. We see what he's looking at. Judson Jakes and the Psycho Circus. So the Killer Clowns have been renamed to the Psycho Circus, which is a bit of a cooler name. Um, we got Jakes on his little floating platform, flanked on all sides by clowns. Plus up front, we've got an anthropomorphic bear and lion uh, wearing armor. Uh, and, uh, Rocket just starts blasting him. He's juking around and his, uh, uh, on his rocket skates and dodging attacks and flying through little fire rings. I don't know what the fire rings are, but he's, he's, he's not on fire. So he's, he's dodging him. I think one of the clowns has like, kind of like the ring that you, like a lion would leap through or something. And he's like somehow like using that. Oh, you're right. That's right. Yeah, the, 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 the clown in the blue with the purple glove or whatever is holding that ring. Yeah. And he must throw it on that third panel, you see. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Good eye. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot more cool rocket stuff here, a lot more cool poses. Uh, Mignola, I particularly like panel four, that pose with rocket sort of looking behind him. Some, just some real cool action stuff here. You can really feel a rocket moving around the panels. Yeah, like that last one where his like legs bent and he's like, yeah, looking over shoulder. There's the explosion, presumably. Yeah, and uh, page nineteen, uh, Rocket manages to get clear of the Psycho Circus long enough to get a shot at the Nutcracker controls, so that Wall back on the Rack and Ruin can put down the shields and do some repairs. Out on the hull, doing his thing, Wall notices some clowns coming at him, so he sticks in his blaster teeth and takes them out. Uh, go on. <laughs> I was just going to say, these blaster teeth seem a little impractical, considering you can't look in the direction he's blasting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The, 
the the shot of Wall shooting the clowns is is awesome, but yeah, it really makes you think. Like you would think with all the the stuff he's got in his little pouch that he could pull out something better than something that would have to like fold himself backwards. Yeah, <laughs> into a C <laughs> shoot straight up in the air. But you know, it's a cool pose. He likes it. It's it's an ab workout for him. Uh, on page twenty. We cut back to Rocket sparring with the clowns while he banters with Jake's, who is revealing his plan, which is actually more or less the same as Lord Divine's plan. He wants to corner the market, making toys so he can charge the loonies for them, and he wants to marry Lila. But unlike Divine, Jake seems to only be after Lila's fortune uh, as the heir to Mayhem Mechanics. I was just thinking, I guess, like, if there's only, like, basically two businesses on this planet, I guess who inherits them would be a pretty important topic. Yeah. I do love Jake's. I love Jets and Jake's. I love the design. I said in the last episode, I thought it was the only design that Sal Buscema really came up with a great design for, and Mignola just, you know, amps it up a bit more. But he didn't even have to redesign it. He just looks cool. I did like the, I mean, I like the iguana toy maker, but he didn't, he lasted about three panels. Mm-hmm. Poor toy maker. So, yeah, one thing I was wondering, thinking about here in this panel was, or in this page is, uh, how old is Lila supposed to be if she's the heir, but unable to claim their inheritance? And was Rocket the same age? Uh, I mean- like... And and if that's the case, how did he end up the marshal in charge of keeping the peace? So I've, I've questions. This has opened up questions. I feel like there has been like some back and forth on like how old Rocket is exactly. Um, like, is he closer to like what an actual raccoon is, or does he actually like age like a human? Um, also, like, what is his lifespan? Because I, I know at some point he mentions that he has a shortened lifespan anyway, um, even in the films. But there's also comics where he's old rock like rocket like way in the future so yeah i don't know i feel like the questions like even now like i don't know how how you could you could place their ages well he's never gonna die because he's too popular and even when characters aren't popular and they die they just never die anyway or they die and they come back (laughs) i do not want to cry in the next guardians movie oh he might buy it die in the movie Oh, come, you, you promised me that there was no, I'm no talking way. about the comics. The movies aren't real. The comics oh. are real. The movies are just an imitation. Uh. <laughs> I, I, I hope they don't kill him off in the movie, but I don't know. Even if they don't, you'll ne- likely never see him in the MCU again. Like, I don't think Bradley Cooper is going to keep coming back and doing it. James Gunn is definitely gone. Uh, I guess that's true. We're on to page 21. Just then... Uncle Pico appears, and he's fed up. He's tired uh, of the toys he designs and builds being wasted by Jake's. He wants to cut to the chase. He shows Jake's and Rocket a video of Lord Divine taunting Jake's with an image of the kidnapped Lila, uh, surrounded by the Black Bunny Brigade. Pico's size on this page is a little confusing, because it looks to me like he's on a podium which gives the impression that he's very small, like the size of a pet turtle, but on the previous page of him stealing the Half-Word World Bible, he's like the same size as Lila. So I don't know. I guess that's not like a normal size podium that a person would stand behind. It's kind of hard to tell because it's off in the background. That was Uh, my assumption. That was just a giant pedestal. Yeah. Or podium. The functionality, again, seems questionable. Um. Uh, I feel yeah. like there's a lot of things functionally in this world that are pretty questionable. That's okay. They're fun. Yeah, we see Lila in the last panel there looking sad. It's sad, Lila. The bunnies are being mean to her. What a bunch of jerks. Still kind of cute, though. Cute jerks. Um, yeah, You'd think in a spaceship that they would be more efficient with space usage, but I guess, you know... Maybe budgets are high or something. Got all that space. You show it off. <laughs> Just like, look how long it takes me to get to my shit. I'm that, rich. <laughs> that is fair, but you gotta... How do they get this thing into space with these giant rooms with podiums that they insisted on? 
Well, this is they're not in space here. They're in they're in the they're in they're in the, uh, Judson Jakes's place. He's not oh, okay, in space. that's right. That's right. We got the cut. Yeah. Um, so now it totally makes sense to have a gigantic room with a pedestal in it. Yes, that's true. All right, but on to the, the final page of the issue. Uh, we got Lord Divine taunting Jakes and Rocket, saying he's going to marry Lila, while Lila cries out for Rocket to save her. Jakes is telling Rocket if he doesn't save Lila so that he can marry her, he'll, quote, drown the Keystone Quadrant in a flood of blood, which seems somewhat graphic. It's <laughs> kind of more... Jakes is going hard. Wow. Uh, leaving Rocket to absorb all this, and uh, based on the last panel, uh, I wouldn't want to be Lord Divine, because Rocket looks pretty mad. He looks... They spent a long time on this one image of Rocket and making him look as angry as possible. Yeah. He's very, very angry, Raccoon. Which, <laughs> if you go to the panel before, like, <laughs> going from that face, where the giant blue eyes to, like, yeah. this angry snarl, that's that's quite the transformation. Yeah, he's yeah. In panel three, he really looks like he's going, Ooh! <laughs> and then like super rabies in the last panel. Yeah, so we're, this is uh, the the end of the issue here. But uh, basically, Blackjack kidnaps Lila. Lord Divine says he's going to marry Lila. Jake wants to marry Lila. Rocket needs to save Lila. So poor Lila has become like the MacGuffin of the story. She's just like everything hinges on Lila. If Lila wasn't here, there'd be no story. Hopefully, hopefully Lila gets a little bit more agency uh, in the rest of the series. I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't remember. It has been a while since I read the whole series, but uh, I suspect she won't get a lot. But hopefully she'll get some at least some fun action scenes because she looks so cool. I, I feel like there have been rumors that they might introduce Lila in the next Guardians. And I like the first half of this comic, like that Lila, like um, if they introduce her, I think they could do a lot of fun stuff with her. Um I don't want her to get in between who to me is my canonical couple with uh, Rocket, which is Rocket and Thor. But, you know, <laughs> if it happens, you know, whatever. But I still think Rocket is the way to go. Throcket? Yeah, that's the Thor slash Rocket couple. Throcket. You can throw that hashtag on Twitter. You got you to gotta really <laughs> listen to hear that name, though. It just sounds like you're saying Rocket. Th- Throcket. <laughs> Throcket. Yeah. Say it like a British stage actor. <laughs> Throcket. Rocket. <laughs> right, that but... one scene with Rocket and Thor where they're just it's just the two of them on the spaceship and Rocket is comforting Thor after his uh loss, like mm-hmm. you can't tell me there's something there. There isn't something there. Right. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, I, li- I like Lila. I like I like her, especially when she's playful and fun. Um, but also, um, you know, she goes to grab that pistol. I would have liked to have seen what she would have done with it. Yeah, it's an it was an awesome. It was very much. It reminded me of like Princess Leia's pistol in the first Star Wars movie. It had like that big, like it's like the longest pistol in the universe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That uh, that brings us to an end. The end, rather, of uh, of Rocket Raccoon number one, the miniseries. Uh, 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 what uh, what do you have any, any any final thoughts on this issue? Oh, I think there's a lot of interesting things. Like I think, just particularly like certain scenes where it's just like it looks like they really had a time to flesh out details. I think it's a pretty strong opening for you know Rocket's little solo series, his limited series. Um, I do think there are panels, as you mentioned, that like it does look like some of it might have been a little rushed, but um, overall, it feels like they were really given the time to like, you know, or maybe like they didn't divide the time up evenly. Maybe that's part of the problem. But like, I don't know. It's it's really fun. Like, I think this is not the rocket that you necessarily know from the movies, but at the same time, it's a very fun rocket and very fun world. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, I agree. Uh yeah, this this rocket, this was the rocket I knew for the longest time. And when they introduced him in the, because this was the only rocket there was for a long fucking time. I remember going to Comic-Con in like the early 2000s 
uh, with friends and Mignola, Mignola was there. Just I keep calling him Mignola because it's what I called him for like 30 fucking years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Mignola, Mike Mignola was there and I was like, fuck, I wish I had brought my Rocket Raccoon miniseries. And people were like, my friends were like, Rocket Raccoon? The fuck is Rocket Raccoon? Like nobody knew who he was. I was the only one who knew who Rocket Raccoon was, at least, you know, I'm not the only one, but I mean, of the people I knew. Um, and I would, I'd show them them the issues and they'd be like, Mike Mignola did this. And I was like, yeah, it was his first work. It was awesome. And they were like, he's going to be pissed if you give this to him. I was like, why? It's awesome. Oh, but I know what they mean. Like you, when you're an artist, like the first work you do, like nobody wants to have that put back in their face. They're just like, uh, no, I don't want to pretend that doesn't exist. Um, well, definitely with some of my earlier music and things like that, like especially when I started writing for Drumline, like the first show that I wrote, I don't want to ever hear that show again. Like if someone put that in front of me, I would, I would deny, deny, deny. Yeah, yeah. But, and this, this, and this isn't like this isn't like out of the park Mignola stuff. Uh, but it is. You, it's like early Mignola. You see him developing his style. He's got that really strong uh, 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 contrast going on in all, all his panels. He builds like these great silhouettes, uh, like that, and, and that panel of Lila there, like saying "Rocket, save me." She's got like the bunnies behind her. She's got like the strong shadows under her chin and stuff like that. It's like really striking little panel there, and, and Mignola does that stuff well, and you can see it here. And then if you read like Hellboy and the stuff from nowadays, it's just like it's been like honed to this. It's like weaponized to to be as cool as it can possibly be. Yeah, I think I wouldn't be. I mean, there's a lot of like good stuff in here, especially for like what is a funny animal comic. Like there's a lot of good art um, inside of here. Like it's I mean, I don't know if I would say if I was a Marvel exec back in the day, I don't know if I would be like oh this is definitely our teenage mutant ninja turtles i'm not sure if that's how they felt about it or how they saw it but i think for its own thing it's i think it's pretty great that they kind of turn this out as their own version or their own funny animal series mm-hmm. yeah yeah i guess that uh that that about brings us to uh to the end the end of the episode um it was uh, it's cool to finally get into the series. I was very excited to get to it uh, and and sort of relive the the Mignola artwork and the and the early Rocket uh, storyline, the kind of quirky reality that it that it exists in. Thank you, Bandit, for joining me for episode three of Heroic Beasts. It was my pleasure. Um, we'll have to have you back sometime if I can continue doing this like once every other month or whatever the hell schedule I can actually do stuff at. It takes yeah. so long. I need to figure out how to make it not take this long. Yeah, just let me know. Send me a text 15 minutes before you want to record. and Right. I will feel free. <laughs> I will jump on. I'll just run up to you with a microphone. Come on, let's, we're doing it now. Go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll be down. Always like surprise interviews. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you uh, to anybody listening. And uh, hopefully we will see you again uh, for the next episode. Uh, We're going over Rocket Raccoon number two. And uh, I think we're going to have another guest on. I'm not sure. Hopefully we can work the schedule out. Uh, But yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. The end. The end. (laughs) Ha <laughs>he likes it it's it's an ab workout for him I, yeah i guess that's true yeah he's probably got great abs i mean we didn't see them when he was naked but i'm sure yeah. <laughs> it's somewhere under it's, there that's why lila wants him to come frolic Oh, yeah, that's right. She can't resist her uncle's abs. That's gross. I'm not going to even <laughs> say that. I'm going to cut that out. I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs>